Good morning, Mark Sutt of HurricaneTrack.com here with your hurricane outlook and discussion for the 5th day of July 2017. I want to show you this new update from Dr. Phil Klotzbach and the Tropical Meteorology Project from Colorado State University. This is literally hot off the press, hot off the PDF, as it were, in this modern day and age. Uh, right here, they have increased their forecast and now believe that 2017 will have above average activity. The odds of a significant El Nino in 2017 have continued to diminish, and most of the tropical and subtropical Atlantic remains anomalously warm. We have talked about this in our daily updates for several months. Not that we know something more than Dr. Klotzbach knows, but we have been able to follow these parameters almost in real time, and of course he is watching that and other factors as well. And so all of this should make sense to us who have been paying attention to these videos all along. And then he goes on to say, with the increase in our forecast, the probability for major hurricanes making landfall along the United States coastline and in the Caribbean has increased as well. And this is very important. He's talking about major hurricanes or the Category 3 or higher. So let's scroll down and take a look at the numbers. And we can see that uh, the update today... Uh, looking for 15 named storms and let's see if that is so for the rest of the season 12 more named storms we have to go through eight hurricanes still we haven't had any hurricanes yet and then three major hurricanes and he's looking at an ace index of about 132 and the ace index think about it as like if the Orlando Magic are going to play um, the you know, New Orleans Pelicans, then how much points, how many points will the Orlando Magic score for the entire game? That's like the ace points. It's a score of accumulated cyclone energy, which has to do with wind energy. And normally, the ace index uh, for any given year is around uh, 100 or so, roughly. And some different methodologies look at different periods of time, but we can generally call it 100. So if a team is averaging 100 points, then in this particular game, and that's the analogy I'm using, that team is forecast to score 132. And in this case, the team is the Atlantic Basin. And the Atlantic Basin is forecast now to be above normal. And then the probabilities for at least one major uh, hurricane, Category 3, 4, or 5, for the entire U.S. coastline, it's about 10% higher than the average for the last century, and it's sitting at 62% there. And the U.S. East Coast is about 8% higher than the long-term average, sitting at 39% uh, compared to the last 100 years at 31%. All right, so this is important. And, of course, the Caribbean is also uh, at about a 10% above average. The last century is 42%. We're looking at 52 So the bottom line is the forecast has increased, and it's all right here in this first paragraph. Uh, very important that we've been monitoring this, the lack of El Nino, the warm water temperatures, and the activity that we have seen already has led him to believe that we will see eight hurricanes forming between now and the end of November. And we've had no hurricanes yet. The total numbers of named storms is not as important to me, even though they certainly matter, as the number of hurricanes, because obviously the hurricanes are going to pack more energy. And we've had zero hurricanes so far, so we have an entire season plus one or two to go worth of hurricanes. Usually we have about six hurricanes a year now on average, and we're looking at eight, and we have had none yet. So, wow, it is going to be a very busy time between now and the end of November. So let's go ahead and go into the um, what's happening with the rest of the tropics today. Fortunately, there's pretty good news this morning. I'll just sort of go ahead and give away the plot. Uh, in the Pacific, both of these systems here are not going to amount to much. They're going to move towards that colder water that we've been showing you, the cooler water relative to average out there. And these, even if they develop into storms, uh, no big deal, and they certainly won't affect the Mexican coastline. In the Atlantic Basin, we still have 94L out here. Overall, the odds are starting to come down just a little bit. Um, it's July, and it's really, really tough to get something to form out this way. If we look at the visible satellite animation this morning, we can kind of figure out what the problem is with the system. Uh, you have a lot of dry air in here. There's a little bit of upper-level wind 
you know, you can see that right there, just a little bit of the clouds wisping away. The shear is really not the biggest issue. It's this stable air mass out here uh, as a result of the Saharan air layer, which is a very common thing in July if you want to track beautiful hurricanes over the open ocean that don't affect anybody, and even shipping interests in today's world should know to get out of the way. You know, a couple of systems that we've seen where instances where, where ships steered right into them, notwithstanding, um, those are odd cases. But I'm just saying, if, if you're looking to track hurricanes over the open ocean, we'll try to make this as, you know, politically correct as possible, because nobody wants to see them plow into land and hurt people. Uh, but we have a deep interest in these things, and this is not the setup for that just yet. It's early July. Pressures are still fairly high overall, even though that's not really a big factor here. Uh, but the Saharan air layer itself is enough to squash that. And we're going to take a look closer at that in a moment. And also, the sea surface temperatures out here, I'm going to zoom in. Our tropical system, 94L, uh, located in here, roughly. And, you yeah, know, the water temperatures are just marginally conducive for development. There's not a lot of deep ocean heat content. Uh, farther west into the Atlantic Basin, where you have 82 degrees Fahrenheit, and even higher than that, points west, that's where these would tend to flourish and blossom. It's this little dip right here in the uh, profile uh, of the, where we look for the at least the 28 degree isotherm. And we're talking Celsius here. Even though 26 degrees Celsius will get the job done in most cases, out here in the open Atlantic with that Saharan air layer waiting for it over here, you really need the maximum amount of moisture and warm water underneath these things that you can get, and that's lacking. They're not below normal, but it's just not enough. Okay, We're trying to figure out why this isn't going yet, and these are some of the clues to that puzzle. Boy, the vorticity certainly got round, so it's bundling the energy. But the ability for this to create convection, if we go back to the animation of the satellite photograph here, you know, it tries to blossom these thunderstorms. And as I mentioned, when the thunderstorms go up, they are drawing air in from all around them. That air is trying to converge around that low-level center. And all this drier air around just gets pulled in. And it deflates. It's like putting a hair dryer to a steamed mirror. All that moisture, is, you know, you see it. It just goes away. And so these thunderstorms go up, they ingest the dry air, that stabilizes things, and then they collapse. But the vorticity is there. If it had a more uh, moist environment without the Saharan air layer dominating to the north, this would already be a tropical storm. Which shows you, and this is part and parcel of what Dr. Klotzbach and his team are talking about. You know, if you went through and read the whole thing, and it's online, you can just Google CSU tropical meteorology or just CSU tropical will get the job done you can read the PDF file and um, you know these precursors these different systems that have formed uh, Brett uh, in the deep tropics and now 94L very close you know it's just lacking that one ingredient the moisture in the mid levels really uh, that would have been off to the races and all of those uh, factors having Brett and then this system uh, in the early part of the season are indicators that we're going to have a, a pretty busy season ahead. And here you can see that Saharan air really dominating now out into the Atlantic, squashing the ability of this system to develop that deep convection. It's not going to go away. This won't just dissolve into nothing. Again, it's not racing off to the west at 25 or 30 miles per hour. So this will still be a trackable entity as it moves off to the west-northwest with time. And when it gets into the southwest Atlantic, we'll certainly have to watch it because it doesn't just go away. You have years, I think like 2013, um, we had Dorian that formed out here in the deep tropics. And everybody was like, oh, there we go. You know, it's a deep tropical development in July. It was later in July. And then it just kind of, it was moving so fast and the dry air and the shear killed it and the colder sea surface temperatures out there. And it did almost just go away, you know, it just kind of dwindled. But in the season like this, uh, this will still be a trackable feature, so we won't ignore it. And even though it may not become what we thought a couple of days ago, the background state is still there for this to be a very busy season. So 
Um, take that to heart. You know, the, this guy, Dr. Klotzbach and his team, um, you know, they have a vested interest in getting this right because this is the foundation of what 10 to 20 years from now could be a, a hurricane forecast a month out where we can give you a geographic region that could be impacted. Wouldn't that be amazing? And you have to start somewhere. You know, some people kind of uh, guff at this, if that's a word. You know what I'm saying? The hem and haw about it, that it's just hype and it's no good and what, what difference does it make? Well, you have to start somewhere. And, and what do you want them to do? You want them to hide the science behind closed doors until they get it right? Um, I don't think so. I think having out in the public to scrutinize when things go wrong helps because you learn from your mistakes and you learn how to hindcast forecast stuff. You know what? Using the uh, the past mistakes to help forecast the future better. So I applaud his efforts. It certainly is beyond my pay grade what he does. And I'm telling you, you look ahead 10 years from now, and we may be able to know three weeks out that a hurricane is probably going to affect Louisiana or Florida or the islands of the Caribbean. Wouldn't it be spectacular to be able to do that and give people advance notice uh, that far out and this is how you do that with this kind of groundwork so get ready eight hurricanes to go we don't know where they will end up but that 62 percent probability of a major hurricane hitting the u.s that's greater than the flip of a coin in terms of the odds so you need to take that into consideration and if you haven't done anything to prepare and are thinking yeah this is gonna be another one of those dud seasons maybe this will change your mind just a little bit and you can be on the right track to being ready all right, well, at least the news in the short term is good. And until we have something actually develop into a hurricane, and I guess August and September are going to be very busy for that, you know, there's really not much to worry about right now. This is not meant to worry you, but rather motivate you to take this seriously and to try to understand what you're up against. All righty? Have a great rest of your Wednesday afternoon with all of that news. And um, we'll see what happens tomorrow. I'll be tracking 94L until it's no longer there to track. All right, I'm Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. I'll be back with you tomorrow.